But here's the thing that I found out about buffaloes. When buffaloes sense a storm coming, they actually run into the storm, minimizing the time they're in the pain and discomfort. What do we do as humans? We try to stay a mile ahead of the grief, never engaging with it, never engaging with the pain. And that makes us stay in the pain longer. Hello, Better Together with Maria Menounos fans. As you can see, my head bobbing to this catchy little uh, intro. <laughs> it's not Maria Menounos. It's Mr. Maria Menounos. Subbing for my beautiful and talented wife. And today, we're going to cover a subject. Uh, I think that um, <laughs> it is uh, it's hitting everybody uh, with the pandemic in the last uh, uh, year or more. Uh, we're going to talk about grief and uh, how to best handle it. Obviously, it's hit my family, but I know it's hit many families. So I'm really excited today to talk to uh, author David Kessler and founder of Grief.com um, to learn more about the grieving process and, uh, and how it can help us. Each person's grief is as unique as their fingerprint. But what everyone has in common is that they need to they, that there's a need for their grief to be witnessed for someone to be fully present to the magnitude of their loss without trying to point out the silver lining. Interesting quote from our, from our guest today. That guest is David Kessler, a death grieving expert, author, public speaker, and founder of Grief.com. His journey coping with grief began as a child when David witnessed a mass shooting at the same time that his mother was dying in a hospital. He also experienced the grief of suddenly losing his 21-year-old son. Through his work, he has taught police, physicians, nurses, and more about tr and more people about trauma, grief, and the end of life. Praised by Mother Teresa, he is the author of six books, including Finding Meaning. Better Together in the Heal Squad are honored to welcome David Kessler. Wow, David. Wow. Tom, 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 I mean, talk about how the universe chose you for this. Yeah, it's interesting. I feel exactly that way, that I wasn't a third grader in school saying, I think I want to do that when I grow up, that... Yeah. It really chose me. And it was one of those things, if I didn't find healing for myself, I don't know what would have happened. And it was one of those young lives that I thought I got to heal myself and find a way to do this for others. Yeah. Wow. And and tell me about the, the mass shooting and your mom. I mean, it seems like it began the, the journey for you. Yeah, it was um, uh, 1973. I was 13 years old. My mother got really sick and had to go to the big city hospital hours away. And you had to be 14 to visit the ICU where she was. I was 13. I'd been taught to lie about beer by my friends, but never to lie at a hospital to get in. And so I wasn't able to see her that much. And at the hotel where we were across the street, one day a fire broke out. And as the um, fire trucks pulled up, shooting began. And it went on for 13 hours. It turned out to be one of the first mass shootings in the US. Turns out to be racially motivated. So at 13 years old, I wasn't able to see my mother when she died and was in this mass shooting, racially motivated. Sounds a bit like today in a lot of ways. Yeah. And then years later, if you don't mind me bringing it up, your son. Yeah. So. Yeah, you know, I had sometimes our mind does these things that, you know, my mind had always said to me, my worst grief is in the past. My life is helping other people. And when I get to be in my late 80s, people are going to die again. And my younger son unexpectedly died at 21. And it's as brutal as you could imagine. Yeah. Brutal then and brutal now. Yeah. Um, and I, I wanted to write a letter to everyone, especially every parent I had counseled, saying I've forgotten how bad the pain is. And I think that's so true. You don't get the pain till you're in the pain. And we think our family and, and family and friends should understand it, but they don't know the pain no. unless you're actually in it. Yeah, I think even, you know, I lost my dad when I was younger, not as young as you. And I, I think... It helped me understand, and I'm very sensitive to um, to children who lose their parents at a young age because of that. But then I've noticed that other people 
don't quite have the same uh, empathy, you know, because they haven't experienced it yet. And also because they might not have your dad. Uh, you know, it's interesting yeah. that sometimes we're like, you know, I've said to people, wait till your mom dies. You're not going to argue with her. And then I realize like their mom dies and they're like, it's a little sad. And I'll go, wait, how can that be? And I'll realize, oh, they're grieving a different mom than I actually am. We all have different relationships, even in a family. Your siblings have different relationships yes. with your parents. Yeah. It's amazing that you both sides of the spectrum you think of your biggest nightmare is to be a child and I, I consider a 13 year old a child to lose uh, a parent and then um, a mother especially and then you know forget the fact that you're witnessing a mass shooting but then the other side of the nightmare is the nightmare of all nightmares is losing a child when you're a parent and it's like talk I, again I, I'm processing this myself about how the universe chose you clearly to to help us because uh yeah you've been through it so and i had worked for you know decades with people and i think a few things that really sort of helped me is one i've been decades of working with people and i saw visually emotionally how people survive the worst things so i witnessed firsthand so many people who'd been through horrible situations and continued to live. And I was always so curious mm. about what's that key to living? What, how do you, you know, I studied people like Viktor Frankl in concentration camps. How do we find light in the darkness? Because, you know, even with the pandemic, how do we find light in this darkness? Because I don't think it's about going in the darkness. Grief puts you in the darkness. It's about finding our way to the light. How did David Frankel, I mean, Victor Frankel, excuse me, from the Holocaust, how did he find, because I, 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 I always think of, I don't know, I'm a history major, so I always think of the people that endured that. And when I hear on Maria's show, so much of it is about um, life is happening for you, not to you, and, you know, but it's really hard to say that to people who've been through that or something similar to that so how how was was he able to find light or peace you know there was a lot about knowing that the situation you're in is temporary and that's one of the things i talk to people about now is we feel like our feelings might be final and he would talk about you know there's an after this concentration camp. There's a tomorrow that will happen. And also this sense of that wasn't just happening to him. It wasn't because of him. And sometimes that personalization gets in the way. And I think the other thing that obviously connects our work together is that after my own son died, I sat at this very desk and one night, my lectures, everything was canceled. And I picked up uh, a few chapters that I had written on meaning and grief. And I picked them up and I looked at them and I went, yeah, like that's going to help. And I threw it back on oh, the desk. Wow. And maybe about two weeks later, I picked it up again and began reading it. It didn't take the pain away, but it gave it a cushion. And I thought there's something here about meaning. And as you know, I had worked with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, the woman, uh, the pioneer who had written um, books on grief and loss. And I had done two with her and she had given us the stages of dying and then the stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. We always told people they're not linear. They're not a map for grief. You don't have to know them or do them in any order. But I just knew when I thought about acceptance, I couldn't just accept that my son died. I really needed more. And that more for me was meaning. And I think we're a generation that just doesn't want to accept the bad things. I think we want to find meaning. And I began interviewing 
people who had been in horrible tragedies and people who had been in murders and or their spouse had died or their parent had died or a child had died. And I started collecting and trying to understand their stories about meaning and how it helped them. And I then everyone was like, you know, it's almost like it's the sixth stage. And I went to the Kubler-Ross family and talked to them and they were so lovely that they gave me permission, her foundation and family to add a sixth stage to her iconic stages. Wow. So do you find, do you think that finding meaning is the, the one of the biggest keys in, to getting through grief? I do because we want their lives to matter. We want to remember people. We want to honor them. And I think meaning is the way you do that. Now, as I share in Finding Meaning, the first thing I always tell people when they hear this book, Finding Meaning, they'll often go, there's no meaning in a horrible death. There's no meaning in a pandemic. Yeah. There's no meaning in a cancer death or a brain tumor or a child dying. And I'll go, correct. The meaning isn't in the horrific event. The meaning is in us. It's what we do later after the horrific event. So, yeah, so I'm trying to think of the, I guess when I think of the meaning of going back to Viktor Frankl, and I didn't know what he did after, but, you know, for for him, his meaning might have been to help other people through like tragedies. And I think also just finding that life is meaningful in itself. And, you know, that's that's not always easy for people to do. And I think we live in a grief illiterate world. We don't know how to talk about this. And yeah. in the pandemic, we've kind of had to learn, you know, grief's not just about death. There's so many other losses, especially in this pandemic, we've, you know, begin to learn about that not only deaths of so many people who have died, but also job losses and the normal world is gone. Yeah. And the things we did and the people we saw and just hugging was a huge loss. Yeah. If this, it was hard to ask because I know I can't even imagine the, you know, what you endured, but you know, for you, what, what was the meaning you found in, you know, your tragedy of losing your 21 year old son? You know, I, I have asked people for years to talk about their loss. So, I, I realized early on, it's only fair that I talk about mine too. So I appreciate the sensitivity and just know you can ask away because I do this with people all the time also. Um, you know, a few things. Um, literally at this desk, when I finished the book, uh, and I just, I never thought my son would be in one of my grief books along with so many other amazing stories of other people and how they found meaning. And I think one of the things is when he was in kindergarten, you know, um, he and his older brother, they, they give out awards for everyone in kindergarten. And he got the award for the child most likely to become a helper. Hmm. And he did not get to become that helper in life. And I hope through writing this book and helping other people, he gets to be a helper now all around the world. Yeah. yeah. So that's one way that I try to see the meaning in all this. And it doesn't mean I don't want him back. You know, it's it's like I would trade anything that happened for, you know, a day with him. Um, and, you know, I think we want our loved ones to have meaning. We want their lives and death to matter. And I also know my son had a wonderful girlfriend, a social worker, and literally they attended one of my lectures, I think about maybe three or four months before he died. And my son loved my work. He was really proud of me. And I had to decide and this is something that I think all of us have to think through. Was his death going to constrict my work 
or expand it. And I knew what he would want. Mm -hmm. I knew that he would want it to expand it and to deepen it. And I think, you know, when working with people now, I can go deeper than I ever have before. Yeah, I think it, um, <clears throat> I think it gives you a, um, a deeper validation. I know if I were sitting with you and I had a cynical bone in my body about your abilities, I would say, uh, <laughs> this guy's clearly yeah. been through it. So if anyone can understand, it's him. Well, and it's true that, you know, if people go, well, yeah, but you don't understand what I've been through. You know, I don't think that like happiness is life as possible after this kind of loss. Mm -hmm. I can't say, well, you know, I didn't think it either. And, I also want to say, I still enjoy life and I still have a good life. And I am really glad to have a life that honors him. And I think we have this weird sense that if I just threw the towel in and gave up, somehow that would be the most loyal thing to do. But that's, that's not what loyalty looks like. You know, loyalty looks like if his life was precious, so is mine. Let me not throw this away that I have. Let me honor the rest of my life so I can honor him. So I can make sure he's never forgotten. I think that is so well put because I do see a lot of people that are almost too guilty to have fun or to smile. And, um, you know, we're dealing with the loss here. And, you know, Maria's dad is just an incredible man. You know, he took care of um, my mother-in-law. He nursed her. He cooked for her. He did everything to keep her here. And um, he's just one that I know he doesn't believe in sitting in pain. You know, he'd rather go outside and garden and dance to Greek music. And, you know, um, and we're keeping him busy here. Uh, I know in his heart he's grieving, but he also... Um, has this instinct to keep living. And I feel like having gone through it with my mom, I remember my mom after she lost my dad also was a long-term battle. And my mom did everything to keep him alive. Um, but within months, she ended up reconnecting with someone from high school who was also a widower, who was actually a friend of my dad's. And I remember we, our family was so happy for them because I know my dad loved my mother so much. He wanted her to be happy. Like that's all he ever wanted. In fact, he, he fixed them up mm -hmm. behind the scenes. We didn't know he was inviting this man over. Oh, I hey. want to see my friend Frankie. I want to see my, and my mother was like, eh, it's weird. He's asking for Frankie, <laughs> but he knew Frankie was a good man. He knew his wife had died of cancer as well. And my dad would talk to Frankie 50 minutes saying, oh, I'm going to take a nap now. And then my mother and Frankie would talk and kind of grieve together. And uh, our doctor knew my dad was doing this. We didn't know. He was telling the doctor, I'm setting her up. She's going to be okay when I'm gone. But uh, my mother was able to, you know, move. she always misses my dad, but she moved on and started her new life. And we as a family were, you know, I'll say for all of our shortcomings, we were very supportive. But the other family, not so much. It was, no, 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 dad. You, that's, you, you need to mourn or whatever. You, you need to not be with somebody. You know, you need to maybe not be happy. You need, you know, or you should be guilty that you're, and I feel like we, the living, it's up to us to kind of free people of that because I think a lot of people have that guilt, you know, where like, oh, I'm not supposed, I can never be happy again. I, I in fact, I know, in fact, thank, David, thank you for, so much for, for this conversation on so many levels because there was a, a, a mother that lost her 13 year old daughter and, through Make-A-Wish, we had gotten in close with the family. And this is probably about 10 years ago. And every year I would check in, she's still stuck. And uh, I'm going to reach back out now because it was the same thing. I don't think she felt like she she deserved to be happy, could be happy, or uh, was worthy of being happy because I can't be, you know, my daughter died of cancer. So um, why should I smile ever again? Uh let, let's break all this down a little. Please. First of all, you know, with um, your mother and the other gentlemen, it's interesting. I think about 
you know, meaning is everything. We have a story about meaning and we also make up negative stories about meaning. Yep. My guess, and I don't know them, this is just a guess. My guess is that other family has a story in their mind that if their dad gets involved in your mom, with your mom, it means he loved their mom less. Mm, yeah. And that just isn't the truth. Love is an expansive That's concept right. that, yeah. you know, we, we don't have a little love that if I love one person, there's no way I can love people again. Yeah. And so your family somehow saw this as more love and you have a story that maybe he was a part of arranging it. There's not a subtraction. The second piece is going back to the, the girl you mentioned who mm -hmm. make a wish. It's interesting you mentioned the smile. When I started um, lecturing again, we had, uh, you know, in the physical world, you remember the physical world that used to happen when we would gather? Mm -hmm. And I would do lectures and retreats. And after my son died, and I began to do them again, we put out brochures and there was a picture of me smiling. There was a few people who wrote in and said, oh my gosh, number one, he's a grief expert. He should not be smiling. And I thought, what, do you want a grief expert who looks like they're at their edge? I mean, I want to go to someone who's found their smile. And second, you know, and they wrote, and I happen to know his son died. And that's so disrespectful for him to be smiling. And I had to really think about that. And I came up with, in for me, what other people think of my grief is none of my business. You know, your vote, your opinion of my grief just isn't my business. What's my business? My business is my younger son who died loved my smile. That's my business. And so my business is I'm going to keep smiling in this world. Mm -hmm. And those smiles are for my son. And if you think it's wrong, oh, well, that's going to be noise in my mind. Right. And I think we have to sort of think those things really true because we all get bombarded by someone telling us how we should grieve. Yeah, we certainly do. Well, we get bombarded by people telling us what we should do, period. I mean, right, right. Don't, today, about, don't shit on me. I mean, especially in social media. It's like, I, it's amazing. I mean, I shouldn't be, I'm not surprised that you got those comments, but um, I just, I, but I still am like confused by people. Like this man just lost his son, you know, like, and, like he's been through enough. Anyway, I digress. Um, what, what do we say? So for the friends uh, and, and out there that, uh, have are dealing with close ones who've who've uh who are experienced death you know so let's say my best friend's wife died or daughter died or or parent died you know what what advice do you give for us in terms of wanting to be there and help right. them help those people so let's talk about some general concepts about grief so first of all grief is an organic process you don't have to learn how to grieve you know, your body, your soul, your psyche was built to take a number of hits this lifetime. You come from a long line of dead people. Every ancestor you have has died. You actually know how to do this. It's our productive move on society that gets in the way. And it gets in the way for a few different reasons. One, we're judgment machines. We want to tell you what's wrong and we want to fix you. And the truth is, and I'm a fixer myself, I get it. If you give me a problem, I would love to give you three solutions. And I can do that for any problem you hand me, except grief. Mm -hmm. I don't have a solution for grief because number one, I don't need to fix you because you're not broken. This is what grief looks like. You are not broken. The other thing that can go wrong is we judge 
each other and ourselves in grief. And I believe grief is a no judgment zone. So let me sort of give you a, a story that puts the pandemic and all this together. About a year ago, I'm out on my street. I'm walking with a friend, we're six feet apart. A neighbor comes up who I probably just had said hi to a couple times. And she says, oh my gosh, don't you do something in grief? And I said, yes. And she said, I've just had to postpone my wedding. And she burst into tears and she cried and cried and we talked about it and I consoled her. And eventually she said, thank you. And what I said seemed to help her a bit. And she walked away. The person I happened to be walking with said, oh my gosh, I can't believe she was going on and on about a wedding that she's had to postpone that she's going to get to have in six months or a year. And here your son died. You're never going to get to have another son. How dare she go on and on with you that way? And I had to go, wait a minute. Let me explain how grief works. There's not a sum zero. There's not a high of grief. And if she gets some of the grief, there's less for me. That's not how it works. She's been dreaming about her wedding since she was five years old. She gets to grieve and cry. All tears count. I have enough security in my grief. The loss of her wedding, which is a real grief, the loss of someone's job is a real grief. All those other griefs don't take away from my grief. The world is big enough that all our griefs get together and live together. But sometimes people get focused on whose grief is the worst. Mm -hmm. And my response is, whose grief is the worst? Yours. Your grief is the worst. Whatever your grief is that you're feeling is probably the worst and to not let your mind compare it to others. There's always going to be someone that something's worse happened to and someone that it doesn't seem like what happened to them is as bad as what happened to you. But at the end of the day, it's about you and your grief, not comparison to anyone else. But David, so, but are there times where, because I'm, I'm, I am always trying to be on the judgment detox. Gabby Bernstein's book, I always am using that in my brain, like judge, stop it, Kevin, judgment detox. I have to say, if I were your friend in this situation, just as much as I was down on the people that were on you about smiling for your book, I'm with the lady next to you saying, okay, it's a wedding, you lost your son. I'm, I'm, I'm with her on that, I have to say. Um, but I also know that we are, the, our judgment is, has, just has to stop. I, I want to give everyone their space for grief, but I do find that um, there's people who sit in grief over minutia too. And, you know, maybe that's not your place, but do you deal with that at some point where you, I know for me, like what helped me through grief was knowing that someone had it worse. So I lost my dad in my twenties, my early twenties, but I had a dad. So step one, I was ahead of everyone else. Two, you know, there were kids who lost their dads at, or moms at 13, like you. Okay, I was lucky. So I use those kind of comparisons to make myself feel better. But is there times where um, you just say like, maybe, maybe we don't need to be grieving this as much? So one of the things that's so important about what you said is we can hold those in two ways we can hold it in an invalidating way. So for instance, if I say, you know what, my gosh, and anyone can do this. I mean, I can do it with my son. If I said, my son died at 21, I mean, I don't even have a right to feel bad because I work with people all the time. Their children die at two years. I mean, they didn't get any time with them or six months. If you use the comparison to invalidate your feelings mm -hmm. that works against you that's actually you judging your own grief and saying my grief doesn't count mm. on the other hand it's such a slight thing you mentioned on the other hand if i go things could have been worse mm -hmm. 
and still realize what I had values, had valued, and it's still life worth living, then it can actually help us. And I'll tell you like an example for me. Someone said, all right, really? You could think of worse? What would be worse than your 21-year-old son dying for you? And I said, the worst thing, even worse than him dying, would be him never being born and me not meeting him this lifetime. Mm -hmm. He didn't have to be my son. You didn't have to get that father you had. You didn't have to get that mother you had or that spouse you had. You know, so there is a sense that some of that can help us realize, oh yeah, things could be worse. Let me appreciate what I did have. So that can be helpful to some people at times. But, you know, I just get nervous because I feel like we're in a society that we we do grieve the smallest things. And again, I'm being judgmental here and I know it, but when I think of losing a son or I think of... Uh, the decimation people have experienced in different generations and even in these generations i think of coronavirus people you know and they do think of like a wedding being postponed or you're not able to go to prom i get it um i get that that sucks but i just don't know about labeling it putting it on par with someone losing a life or even if it was they, they lost a job but that job was going to be their livelihood and now the family's completely disrupted and goes into poverty. I get that, but I just, um, yeah, I give you, you credit. Know, I give you credit for being evolved enough to but, not but have Kevin, that. Judgment, let me tell you, you know. the difference. Yeah, because I don't think it's. I'm really more evolved than you. I think you're seeing it together, and let me explain why. So picture that 16 year old girl. Her parents are alive. Everyone's alive in her world. No one's died. She's 16 years old. A pandemic hits and her prom gets canceled. Yeah. It actually is the worst thing that's ever happened to her. I mean, she doesn't wake up in the morning and say, David Kessler's son died. My prom doesn't count. Yeah. My son dying actually didn't happen to her. But the, her well, I understand a 16 year old not understanding that. I thought there was someone for a wedding. That's an adult. I understand a kid right. doesn't understand, would but not even be for connected. The woman with the wedding, yeah. it is her worst loss. But let me tell you this, because I think this is what goes along. When people say to me, what's the goal of grief work? Or what's the goal of grieving? I say you have to learn two things to grieve fully and live fully. So I wouldn't teach that 16 year old or the 25 year old whose wedding canceled. Yes, it's grief, it's trauma, go home and cry about it. I would say you've got to grieve it and you've got to live through it. So I think when we see it in that context, we're sort of not letting people just sort of, you know, sit in their grief and stay stuck there forever i think that's the key i grieve it and live through it yeah i mean look i say any situation you can go through or you can grow through i think if you look at it that way yeah how do i grow through this we again a lot of the experts who come on our show david they all say the same things but in different ways you know so it's even approaching when bad things happen we had some we interviewed yesterday and and every time something bad happens, um, she's going into grief. She didn't mention grief because, again, we're all saying it in a different way. Right. But she's, she said what helps her through is she'll stop and say, okay, what's the lesson in this? How do I, how do I grow? She, she, no, she, again, she didn't say go or grow like you said, but she said what is the lesson? What can I, what, what's the universe? What's God trying to teach me right now so I can move forward? Right. And the only thing I would add to that, and this relates back to meaning, is you can't jump to the meaning or the lesson without feeling your pain first. Mm. You can't heal what you don't feel. One of the things, if you don't Wait, mind- that's, that that's interesting. You have to say that again, that's a gem. You can't heal what you don't feel. Correct. You have to heal it. You have to feel it to heal it. Here's an interesting thing. When I was 
researching this book, Finding Meaning, I never thought in my wildest dreams I would be looking at buffaloes and how buffaloes live. But here's the thing that I found out about buffaloes. When buffaloes sense a storm coming, they actually run into the storm, minimizing the time they're in the pain and discomfort. What do we do as humans? We try to stay a mile ahead of the grief, never engaging with it, never engaging with the pain. And that makes us stay in the pain longer. So you do have to go through that dark night to get to the growth, to get to the lesson, to get to the other side. So you have to do both. It's the grief, the pain. And by the way, the pain in grief, when people go, you don't know how intense this pain is. I'll go, well, did you love them a lot? And they'll go, yeah. And I'll go, well, the pain is a reflection of the intensity of the love. You know, grief is optional this lifetime. You don't have to grieve anyone. But if you're going to love people, if you're going to get attached to people, you're going to grieve them. And when I realize that, I don't know about you. Oh, my gosh, I'm going to grieve everyone someday, possibly, (laughs) or people are going to grieve me. Well, I don't want to go through this world without loving people. I don't want to make this journey without love. So love and grief are a package deal. David, do you have any tips on how to um, feel it, to heal it? Because I think you're you're so on to something. I know in this country, we all look for distractions or ways to sedate the pain. Could be shopping, partying, it could be any number of things. Right. I think that we that is kind of the go-to. And I think that it does extend the period of grief. So is there kind of a way to sit in it? Like you said, the way the buffaloes run toward the storm, is there a way that we can do it? So here's one of the things that backfires around that. And it's it's a, a byproduct of our modern self-help movement. We have these half felt feelings. So for example, we get angry and we say, I shouldn't be angry. I have no right to be angry. Kids die in Sandy Hook or over a half million people died in this, the pandemic. I have no right to be angry about my loss or my feelings. And we diminish the anger. We don't feel it. We get sad and we say, oh my gosh, suck it up. And we don't feel the sadness. And what happens to us is we have all these half felt feelings I think of them as like in a thousand Tupperware things behind us that we carry that are half felt. Now, why is that? We sort of, you know, I did a a talk the other day on um, toxic positivity, that we can bright side people and ourselves that we think everything should be a mountaintop. Everything should be a go team. And that's not how life works. It was interesting. I was on social media talking about social media. I was scrolling one day and I saw a a graphic that said, for every day you get angry, you lose a day of life. And for every day you smile, you get another day of life. And I went, oh, that pisses me off. I got to switch to Instagram. And That's kind of what we do with some of those feelings like sadness and anger. We try to get rid of them instead of feeling them. If you felt your anger, it would come out, it would be expressed, and you'd be done with that feeling, and you'd move to the next one. Same way with sadness. I can't tell you how many people have said to me over the years, David, you don't understand. If I started crying, I would never stop. And I say, I have been with thousands of people. Every single person stopped crying eventually. I know your mind says this feeling would take over, but it's not true. You're in charge of your feelings. You would just let them out. You would give them life. You would feel it and heal it. But we got to allow them to come out. And grief is messy. 
you know, we're in a world that we don't want to be messy, but grief's a messy, organic experience. I, uh, a couple of things came to mind. I, I feel like recognizing that we're, ang I think a lot of us don't realize we're maybe angry or we, we don't even, so I think you're right. If you maybe sit and talk to people to figure out, you know, how you are feeling. And I think when you recognize, yeah, I'm angry, I think you're halfway there. And I feel like, you know, we keep hearing on the show so much about taking time out, you know, through meditation or being out in nature and just, I think that might help to sit and process it, you know, to, to actually feel it. And I, I think you're right. I think because of our society, and I don't know if this is just because we're a capitalist society, but I think we are so into get up and go progress. Got to keep moving. Got to keep, got to keep fighting. Just, I got to brush myself off. I, I was, uh, I randomly bumped into a, a young lady with uh who actually had a rare form of lung cancer and she was ripped with muscle and you could see she just was one of these type a's go go getters and she was confused why she had this um disease and you know the way she was dealing with it was just get up and fight i'm gonna you know i'm running you know 10 miles a day and, and i said also i'm a lay person but as an outsider i feel like you're doing too much. I think you need to kind of sit with this and process it. And I don't know. I think that maybe Western civilization, we're just trained that way. But well, and there, there's you know. an acceptance of what is, you know, I'm a big believer that freedom is found in reality. You have to accept what is if I get if I'm and just like you said, many times I say to people, you sound angry. I'm not angry, David. I'm just very irritable. I'm very annoyed. <laughs> We like don't even want to admit we're angry. Yes, no. And then we go, okay, I need to go meditate on this. And I'll say to people, if you're going to go meditate on this, please in your meditation scream. And it'd be even better if you could yeah. scream in the woods or scream in go your out in the that, yes or run yeah or hit the pillow, but allow your anger to live. And here's the thing: how many of us were raised? Anger is inappropriate angry is wrong because we saw someone who did anger in a dangerous way in our childhood mm. and we internalize that and we don't know how to let healthy anger out and i can tell you i actually have if you went into my bedroom you would see a baseball bat by my bed and you would think boy he's either a player or you know if you come into his house and break in you're going to get a baseball bat it's actually once a week, something just gets to me and I have to take to my bed with that baseball bat before I have a conversation with someone because I need to release that anger. And here's the thing people don't understand about anger. Anger is pain's bodyguard. Anger is pain's bodyguard. It's pain. And I love the baseball bat. Like, I think that's before you have that conversation, you actually get it out. So those are some of the things that I, that's what I'm looking for is, you know, how do we feel it? And then how do we get it out? Yeah. Use that baseball bat, allow yourself to cry. And here's the thing. Sometimes people will say, and this is where acceptance comes in. Another tip. Sometimes people go, David, but I'm stuck. My feelings are stuck or I'm numb. I can't feel my feelings stuck and saying something's wrong with you because you're stuck or you're numb is actually a judgment. And if you are judging your feelings as wrong, you can't feel what you're judging. So when you are numb or you are stuck, then you basically what you're saying is like, that's okay. You accept it. You accept it. Yeah. You know what? I'm not feeling anything and that's okay today. And that's a feeling you're going to find you're going to move right through it. What What about if you're a male and you're taught not to cry or you're brought up right. in that way like me. Right. And I've done things like um, I'll watch movies that will make me cry to jumpstart my cry. Right. What do you think of that? And I work many times with a lot of men and one of the two couple of things I'll do, 
is sometimes I'll, instead of sitting with a man discussing it when the physical world, I'll take a walk. Sometimes walking mm -hmm. becomes easier to get to access our emotions. The other thing when a man says to me, yeah, well, men aren't supposed to cry. I'll go, do you remember at 9-11, the firefighters who were there trying to rescue their buddies who had died? They were crying. You're saying that's weak? You're saying that when they're like, well, no, no, that, well, no, that's not weak. And that's not, those tears are okay. And I go, well, so are yours then. So are yours. If they get to cry about their colleague that was killed, their brother that was killed in 9-11, you get to cry about your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, your child. It's okay. The world doesn't end. It certainly doesn't. But we got taught that be strong yeah. and be strong can be code for don't have a lot of feelings. Yeah, it was funny. One of Maria's aunts was bawling her eyes out at the um, at the a recent wake for Maria's mother. And uh, I ran over and hugged her. But other cousins were saying, come on, you need to be strong. You need to be strong. And I, it wasn't my place. I didn't want to say, right. but I'm like, I don't really think that she needs to be strong right now. I think she needs to cry and mourn. And that's the thing. It's like, you know, one of the most common things that's said at funerals these days when we can have them is the person who died would not want us to be sad today. And I sit there in the funeral thinking, really, of all days, we can't even be sad today. Mm -hmm. Like they wouldn't want us to cry today. We're at the funeral. Is there a better time to cry? Yeah. Don't tell me what to feel. Here's one that I wonder I want to run by you. So, you know, Maria's dad's type 1 diabetic. He's 76 years old. And um, I was, M Marie and I, we had a concern that he could go so hysterical with his crying that he could actually physically die, perish. He could do, you know, so... Um, is that ever something that comes up with you where, you know, you, 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 you can be too much and someone can like really work themselves into a stroke or heart attack or. So that's a story. We all do this. Yeah. It's a story we make up in our mind. Okay. And it's, it's another form of catastrophizing and you two have had a catastrophe. Yeah. Her mom has died. That is a catastrophe. So your mind catastrophizes. Your mom says, your, your, your mind says, oh my gosh, he could work himself up into the crying and it could physically harm him. I can tell you an alternative story. He could cry a lot. It could release him. Yeah. It could bring him peace. It could bring his blood pressure down. Crying could make him healthier. Right. Which he did, by the way. He did right, cry a lot, right. and he still does. Right. So, but I, notice how all our minds make up that story about, oh my gosh, we could have too many feelings. Mm. And if we had too many feelings, what would we do? Feel them, one feeling at a time. That's all would happen. And I, and I can see the downside of not feeling them in the long term and i think that's what happens is we don't really feel them and so now five years ten years fifty we now have all these new potholes and all these other problems because we did not sit and we didn't allow ourselves to grieve right and to just really understand in this world what we can really do for one another in their horrible pain is to witness their grief to see it to say, Maria, or Bob, or Susan, I have no idea what you're going through. I don't know how bad this feels to you. I don't know what your pain's like, but I'm just going to sit next to you. And I'm going to sit with you in this pain. And I'll be right here if you need me. Or say, look, there, there's no right words to say. There's no right words to say. It's interesting, we, we talked and you mentioned grief.com, grief.com. On grief.com, one of the most visited pages is the best and worst things to say to people in grief. Because mm -hmm. we don't know what to say to people. And so 
I always tell people that some of the things you don't want to say, just to give a few tips on this, is you don't want to start a sentence with at least, because then you're minimizing it. Yeah. At least they died quickly. At least they're not suffering anymore. At least they're in a better place. It's sort of another way of saying, cheer up in your grief. And then we're fixing them instead of letting them be there. When really the best thing to say is, I don't know what the right words are, but I love you and I'm sitting here with you through this. Yeah, yeah I'm here. I'm here. Yeah, I'm here and I see your pain. I see your pain. That's all we want is our pain to be seen. And and I, that's constructive um, and applicable. If, with some of the other steps you had mentioned earlier, you, you had mentioned that there's no real map and no real order. It's just, are those stages something that we're just going to experience whether we like it or not? Um, so I'm trying to wrap my head around, is there is could is there any other kind of map to help us go through this? Sure. So if you're someone who's looking for like some structure, the stages are great. They help you understand because sometimes people, when they haven't experienced grief, think they're going crazy. What's wrong with me? Like when we talk about denial, that feeling of I cannot believe they're gone. I can't what's wrong with me that I can't believe they're gone? I'll go, that's what denial looks like. That's just the stage of denial. You're completely normal, right? Denial, anger. Anger is appropriate. It's okay to get angry. It's okay to get angry at the person who died. It's okay to get angry at God. I believe God understands our anger. I believe our anger, yeah. you know, God's big enough to handle our anger. Then bargaining is all the what ifs we go through. Oh, if only I had done this, if only I had done that, right? To go, that's a completely normal experience. And the depression is the sadness to go, of course you're sad. Oh my goodness, your mom died, your dad died, your sister died, of course you're sad. And then acceptance. Now acceptance doesn't mean you like the loss or you're okay with the loss. Acceptance means you just acknowledge the reality of it. And there's not one big acceptance that you find. It's not, it's little acceptances. You find a little acceptance when you plan the funeral. You find a little more acceptance when you go to the funeral. All of those are little moments of acceptance. So when people are sort of going, I don't know how to do this, the stages can be helpful. And if you're fine being completely organic, be completely organic. There's no right or wrong way to do grief. Other than maybe not doing it, right? Like just to escape it. Let's say you just, just drug out or you're just, you know, like, right? It, it, or... Well, I'll tell you, if that happens and you don't die from whatever you do, the grief gets put on the shelf. And it's just waiting there. It'll, yeah. Grief will just wait patiently for you. So you might put it off, but it doesn't go away. And 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 does it come back in your experience in worse proportions if you don't? No. No. Okay. Comes back pretty much as it was. Right. But it will in this lifetime if it you will. don't. It will. And I'm very straight based oriented. You know, when it comes back, I never say to anyone, well, because you didn't deal with it before it's like okay you're ready to deal with it now and sometimes we we might not be able to deal with it because we're in survival mode mm. a widow whose husband died and she's got three kids to raise might be just trying to financially survive mm. and get the kids to school and yep. get them to soccer she might not have time to just go to grief groups and process it and all those things so it gets put on the shelf till she's ready and has the time and she doesn't have to decide, it will just naturally come down. And when it comes down, no one ever says, this is such a good time for the grief to come back. It just is. You know, it's so hard because when you are somebody who, um, if you're controlling or, you know, you want to have control over your destiny or you, you know, you're a type A, 
or you want to be very successful. I think all of those things, it's it's tough. Grief makes it tough to deal with grief because you're like, okay, let's put it in a box. What are the what are the five six steps I stages I have to go through? I'm going to go through them, for, and it doesn't work that way. It just kind of happens, and I think that's really hard for that personality type to deal with. And for that personality type to gr realize grief doesn't need a lot of time, but it needs dedicated time. You know, you can't go, oh, yeah, my grief's in the back there somewhere. I'm dealing with it. And also look at that belief system and look, I get it. I'm controlling and type A and fixer and everything myself. But the reality is you just have to look around. I mean, there's a million celebrities that have gone on to do amazing things who have found meaning in honor of their loved ones who have died. There's a million sports figures who have gone on to do great things, not in spite, they've done it in spite of the grief and in addition to the grief. Just look at Barbara Bush or Joe Biden. I mean, horrible losses. Yeah. And they seem to be successful in continuing. So it's a bit of a myth. I think the myth is, let's just break it down for people. The myth is if you felt your feelings, you go sit in a puddle and you have a pity party and you're just not successful anymore. And that's just not how it works. Really successful people grieve fully and live fully. Grieve fully and live fully. Wow. Grief.com. Um, and the most recent book is Finding Meaning. David Kessler is the author for, you know, I feel like with Corona, I just look at my Facebook page, David, and it's like during the peak of Corona, I just would see one parent's uh, rest in peace after another. It was brutal, brutal. And so right. I think what you're doing is of great benefit for everybody. And we have mm -hmm. online groups. We have free Facebook groups. So there's a lot of help out there for people. And anyone who's just like, I don't know how this grief works. They can go to aboutgrief.com and just get some a little video showing them just how grief works. I appreciate you doing this today and helping to open the subject for people to talk about. Yeah. Well, you know, it's a, it, other cultures don't see death in the same way we do. You know, I think healthier cultures look at it as a part of life. We sweep it under the rug and then we're like stunned when we all right. know <laughs> our time here is short, some shorter than others. But it's something that, yeah, we just, yeah, we don't, I don't feel like we deal with it in the healthiest way. And so it's very important with people like you to come and, and help us. So I really appreciate and it. I'll tell you the last thing, if I may. Please, no. You know, we have that idea. I got to be happy. I got to be peppy. I got to deny this death. I got to be part of that productive culture. And just look at me in my world. I, unfortunately, I'm around death more than you could imagine. You'd only have to look in my email box. And when I think about all the death in the world, it doesn't make me become sad and get depressed and quit living my life. It's actually the opposite. When I realize, wow, every seed is going to become a flower. Every flower is going to live and die. And that's true with you and I and every other person. I mean, unfortunately, the death rate's 100%. That's the reality. But when I let that in, I don't get sad and depressed. I go, let me make the most out of this life. Let me make the most out of today. Let me connect with you. Let me connect with the people who are living. Let me not shy away from life, but let me drink it in more because I don't know how long I have and I want to fully live it. I want to be used up, you know, as the saying goes. And meaning helps me get there. David, how do, does belief in an afterlife uh, help you when you're counseling people? Or is that something you just keep off limits and keep to the individual? People bring up the afterlife and the afterlife is important. I wrote a book called Visions, Trips and Crowded Rooms, Who and What You See Before You Died. And I, I interviewed doctors, nurses, social workers, priests, rabbis, ministers about how when people are dying, their loved ones come to greet them. And I think when we realize birth may not be a beginning and death may not be an ending, it actually helps us in our grief. And 
it's interesting in modern psychology, things have shifted. You know, decades ago, there was this thought about you've got to find closure, they've dead, stop that. Now it's different. We realize a continued relationship with the person who died is actually important and healthy. That this idea of I still talk to people who have died. I still talk to my mother or my younger son or think about them or wish them well or send them love is actually a healthy thing to do. And I also say, don't give death any more power than it has. Death has the power to end a physical life, but it cannot end our love and it cannot end our relationships. And they continue on, even I believe, with people who have died. You know, it's funny, there was a pamphlet that Maria, we got for some of the grieving counselors about um, my mother-in-law's passing. And they said, you know, at the end, they they can say they're seeing loved ones. And um, they, the, the pamphlet put it out like it was almost uh, a hallucination. And I could tell the nurse was just towing the line, but she looked at us and said, you know, it's whatever you believe it is, you know, but I know with my dad, he saw his whole family. I mean, that's why I wanted know. to interview the doctors and nurses and social workers and priests yeah. and rabbis and ministers who get it and understand that. And it occurs too often all around the world to be just a hallucination. There's more to it than that. Wow. Yeah. And then someone yesterday we interviewed, it's funny, David, having you on, was mentioning how a lot of times, at the very end, uh, you know, people will be in these like, you know, kind of comatose states, but then they'll kind of pop up, you know, for those last, right. they'll have one last little burst. And she was of the belief is that they're excited. They're, it's, it's adrenaline and excitement to go to the next world. And again, for the deathbeds I've been on, I've seen this kind of like, I don't know how he's, he's on all this morphine. I don't even know. He's opened his eyes and he's, he's talking to everybody. Like this is a, I've seen it. I saw it with his mom too. Eyes were open and present. And it was like, huh, how is this and happening? In, right. And in hospice and end of life and palliative care, we talk about that. We often call it the rally that just like you said, the person's been, you know, sleeping in a coma out of it. And there's this burst of energy and like, it's tough for the family because the family's like, Oh my gosh, it's a miracle. They're here. And they're going to be healthy and live. And then the person dies. We know the rally is often a sign they're about to die. And I, when people go, oh, my gosh, it's a miracle. I go, maybe the miracle is that you're getting a few more minutes mm. to really take that in. Yeah. Yeah. All right, David, thank you so much. We'll finally let you go. But, yeah, I had, to, I had to go there. Once yeah, again, it's great. Thank you. David Kessler, author of the book Finding Meaning and a founder of Grief.com. Uh, so helpful. Thanks again, David. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me today.